It's Wednesday night, and we're so happy to see you all. It's a good day. Some days are better than others. Today was a great day. <laughs> but every day is a good day, right? Today was Wacky Wednesday at our school, so I did take the pink out of my hair and take the little puff balls off my head. So <laughs> Tomorrow's neon day. Stay tuned. You can see that Sunday. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, maybe not. Maybe next time, though. You never know. Sometimes it is Wacky Wednesday. Well, let's open up in prayer. Lord, we are so thankful to have Wednesdays to be able to come together and just to fellowship, and it's just such an awesome feeling to be around just the love of all these people and your love, Lord. We just thank you so much, and we want to just read from Ephesians 1.17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that in which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, and the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Thank you, Lord, for just filling my mind with your thoughts, and let me just speak through my vocal cords. Lord, we just give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you guys are still praying that over you guys every day, because we need more wisdom, more revelation, more knowledge. And I think, um, I am i don't want to whiz through chapter 8, but I do kind of want to go through it, because there is a video I do want you all to see. Um, I just think it has a lot of really good points. I mean, it's still a little bit on, on just the covenant, but really the covenant, what Jesus did. And I, I think that's so important as uh, what the authority is as we as believers to really understand what Jesus did, where he went, what happened to him, and just to just wrap yourself in all that knowledge and just absorb it just every day. Put it on like, you know, your armor, your coat, just get into the word and just meditate on it. And some of the things that we talk about, some are heavy, some are lighter, but every time you just start thinking about what Jesus did for us will make you a stronger believer. And, and that's how I do feel like we're going to see more signs and wonders because it's already happening. Things are happening all over. And so let's start with, is this the one? <laughs> when Jamie and I first started out in the ministry, we really struggled financially. Occasionally, I'd work odd jobs to help make ends meet. One day I came home from a painting job feeling so sick that I could hardly stand up. I just wanted to lie down on the couch and rest. Jamie was in the kitchen fixing me lunch. When she saw me on the couch, she asked, what are you doing? I feel sick. I don't know if I can eat anything. We had already been teaching other believers the same truths we've mentioned so far. You have to use your body to quit yielding to the devil. Don't cooperate with him. Do the very thing that you don't feel like doing. Resist the devil and fight against him with your physical action. James 4, 7. Jamie came right over and got me up off that couch. She put my arm around her shoulder and started dragging me through the house saying, we need this money. You will go back to, <laughs> go back to that job. You're healed. She made me get up and started acting healing. She just forced me to practice what I'd been preaching. Praise God, in 10 minutes, I was over it and felt well again. I went back to work and got paid that day. (laughs) She is a tough woman. You know, but God bless her. You know, when you have a partner that can just come together with you and help you live out your faith, that is a very awesome woman right there or spouse because 
there's times when you need that little extra, you know. If you all have any comments, please just hop in. I don't want to, like, race through it, but I am going to go a little faster. Act on the word. The night before I was ordained in the ministry, I hurt my back opening our garage door, our broken garage door. We were living in Seagoville, Texas at the time. As I bent over and started lifting up the garage door, it got caught and something just popped in my back. The pain that immediately shot through my body was so excruciating that it knocked me to the ground. My one-year-old son had been watching me. I told him, go tell mommy, but he just sat there jabbering at me. <laughs> Eventually, he wandered into the house and brought Jamie out. When she saw me lying there, I hurt so bad that I wish all I could do was whisper, I hurt my back. Well then, get up. Jamie <laughs> pulled me up, prayed over me, and said, now act the, you act on the word of God. Again, we needed <laughs> to be the able to work. So she cut me no slack. Amen. I started doing <laughs> things with my physical body. My shoulder blades were back so far, they were touching each other. The pain was excruciating, but I forced myself to do things that I didn't feel like doing. Finally, over a day's period of time, I got to where I could do sit-ups and other things. Although my movement had, had returned, my shoulders were still pulled back. I went to bed that night, and I woke up on the day I was scheduled to be ordained. My shoulders were still pulled back, but I just kept fighting it all day. Right before I went to my ordination service, service, I declared, I am going to act healed. I'm going down there, and I will be ordained. By the time I arrived at church, I was healed. My actions played a major part in receiving and manifest, manifesting that healing. You can't lie in bed acting sick and at the same time release the supernatural power of God. You must learn how to use your physical body to resist the devil and cooperate with the Lord. If you don't step out in faith and act on the word, you'll limit God. James 2.20. Jesus also made a statement in John 14, 13 and 14. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Okay, so he's not really, he's not talking about prayer. Um, the Greek word here is demand, not ask. And that's a pretty strong word for a lot of people, that they don't like the fact that they're demanding of God. But these are the things that God has already put into place, and so we didn't need to demand our right to that, whatever it is. So it says again, And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my Father, ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Here to have ye asked nothing in my name, ask and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. And again, the Greek actually reads, whatever you demand as your rights and privileges, you've got to, you've got to learn what your rights are. So again, the word demand, you're demanding something. Isn't that, uh, this is a question. Are you demanding of God, or are you demanding of the word, his word? His, or, his word, what he has already put into place. Right, his promises. His You're promises. putting a demand on his promises. Mm -hmm. So that's how I look at it. It's like, no, no, I look at his word. His word like, I'm putting a demand on it because it's there for me. I have a yes. covenant. I'm putting a demand, and that's how I look at it. People miss that. Yeah, it, it's not a a disrespectful thing. Mm -hmm. It's more of the word you're speaking Absolutely. to. Absolutely. We can limit God. We've seen that God is a spirit and that he gave dominion over this earth to physical human beings. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. In doing so, he limited his own dominion and authority. If we don't cooperate with God, we can limit him. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Psalm 78, 41. Yes, we can limit God. Jesus dealt with this in his own hometown. He could there do no mighty work because of their unbelief. Mark 6, 5, and 6. It's not that Jesus didn't want to. He couldn't do any mighty work because of their unbelief. Even the Lord Jesus Christ had to have <coughs> cooperation from people to release his power into their lives. Religion says God is sovereign. He controls everything. No, he doesn't. 
God is sovereign in the sense that he's king of kings, but he doesn't control everything that happens on the earth. God isn't limited in the sense that he doesn't have the power. He has the power, but he gave dominion over this earth to physical human beings. Because of his own integrity, he will not overstep that authority and violate his own word. Therefore, God has limited his own sovereignty, his own ability to intervene in the affairs of men here on the earth. Until he became a physical being himself, he didn't have the authority to come down to this earth and straighten out the mess that men had created. For additional study on this topic, I recommend the sovereignty of God, taking the limits off God, and spiritual authority. They all go into further detail than I can right here. All authority that was given to Christ belongs to us. And we may exercise it right now, today, tomorrow, whenever you need it. We, we help him by carrying out his works upon this earth, and of course we get our power from him. But that's just very important that we have to work together with Christ. And sometimes the people go, well, you know, I can't get along without Christ. Of course we can't get along without Christ. I mean, we have him every day, and we should be working with him and the Holy Spirit every day, but he has to work through us for a physical body. Earn the right. God himself operates within this law, these laws of authority. He will not violate his own word. Because we live in a culture today where authority isn't a big issue, these truths can be hard to comprehend. People basically don't submit themselves to authority. They only do what they are forced and demanded to do, but they don't recognize authority. People violate authority all the time. I don't mean this in a critical way, but the younger generation is, as a whole doesn't respect authority the way the older generation does. They've been raised in such a way that they believe that they can get away with anything. Mm -hmm. They see little wrong with cheating. They aren't submitted to authority. They think as long as they don't get caught, everything is fine. That's absolutely wrong. All of life is based on authority. I teach our Karis Bible College students that you have to earn the right to speak into someone's life. You have to gain their respect before they'll let you minister in their heart. This, to their heart, I'm sorry. This works on every level. One reason so much of what's called evangelism today isn't very effective is that it's disrespectful and offensive. Some Christians just walk up to a stranger, stick a religious track in their face, and say, you're going to hell. Repent. <laughs> then they try to coerce that person to submit to them, pray a prayer, However, they haven't even had the common courtesy to introduce themselves and ask, how are you? How's your day going? These so-called evangelists just come up and get right in people's faces. That is absolutely wrong. I think we've all ran across a few of those. And it's always fun when you're with non-believers and they're like, oh, those people. And you're like, okay, I'll just take the track. Let's just keep moving, you know, because they, we do. We need to get to know our people, you know, the people around you, because that's part of your community. You know, you've got to love on them. That's it's also God. Who are you? Well, in Kansas City once, a guy came up to me after a meeting and started railing on my wife. He said, if you were the man of God, you'd straighten this out. You'd make her do this and that and this other thing. Then he started criticizing and giving me all his opinions about how my wife should dress. If you knew Jamie, you'd know that my wife is a very conservative dresser. She never wears anything inappropriate. There is nothing wrong with her. This guy just had a bunch of legalistic, religious opinions about jewelry, makeup, and hairstyles that he was trying to force on us. But basically, I stopped him right in the middle of this tirade, asking, who are you? He, he asked me his name. He told me his name, and I said, no, I, I mean, who gave you the right to speak to us this way? You have no dominion, no right, no authority over my wife. God did not die and appoint you to take his place. You're nobody. I don't care what your opinion is. Of course, this guy was highly offended. His attitude was, how dare you speak to me that way? But since he had the authority, audacity, wow, <laughs> audacity to confront me, rail on my wife and tell me what to do, I just decided to respond in kind, mister, you have no authority in my life. I would never just walk in and start telling the President of the United States what to do. It's not because I feel inferior, 
It's not because I don't believe God has given me some valuable things to say. I just recognize that I'd have to earn that right. He would have to request it. I'm not his superior. I can't just force my way in and start spouting opinions. It's the same for the mail clerk in the business. You may have some idea what would work, but you can't just barge into the CEO's office and start telling him what to do. You must remain under authority. Now, if you're a good CEO, you'd encourage your feedback. They'd even occasionally go to the hourly workers and ask, what do you think? But really, it's his choice to ask for input. You don't have the right, the authority, to just go up to the CEO and start spouting off. I would never go up to one of the ministers I see on television or hear on the radio and start rebuking them and telling them things that I disagree with about I'm listening. I've listened to some of them, and they are absolutely wrong on some points. God has shown me some truth in his word that could help them, but I respect them enough to wait to be invited in. I'm not their superior. They don't submit to me. We don't have the kind of rapport built up. I'd never do such a thing. Sometimes it's a, a little bit of a fine line, even with our friends, on how much they know, how much they understand. And then when you start speaking truth that's a little higher and a little deeper than they've ever gone, then it's, it can be highly offensive. I've got a real good friend at school, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, God's got this. He's sovereign. I'm like, eh. You know, so you kind of just gently kind of work into that going, we have the authority. And, you know, you start to just kind of explain slowly instead of just slam them with the hard, cold truth sometimes. <laughs> But I, I think it's, it's just working into it so we don't offend, but we can still love and tell the truth. None of your business. However, every day someone does that to me. Whether it be in a letter, a phone call, an email, or in person, someone who considers themselves to be official standard of what's right and wrong reams me up one side and down the other. They've been never witnessed to anyone, never, been someone, never set someone free, never done anything for the Lord, and yet they think that they know it all. If they just understood authority, they would stop these kinds of abuses and realize that they have to earn the right to speak into someone's life. I've told my Bible students before, there are some things I know about some of you sitting right here now, problems in your life. However, these problems are outside of school, and you haven't come to me about them. If we haven't built a report to where I feel like you've opened up to me and given me the freedom to candidly speak to you, then I won't come to you and talk to you about those kinds of things. It's not my place. It's none of my business. I'll deal with things that affect people while they're at school, but I'm not going to pry into your personal life. Some folks think, well, that's wrong. You ought to get more involved. No, I believe it's wrong for you to stick your nose into other people's business. It really does come down to authority. And listening to the Holy Spirit. I think we just <laughs> need to really tune in. Go ahead. Defeated. God is a God of authority. He set structure in place, and he's not going to circumvent it. When one of my employees disagrees with a superior, I tell the person, go to your superior and talk to them about it. Don't circumvent the superior by coming to me and trying to get me to counter their opinion. It works better this way. That's how God is. He established authority, and we need to recognize that God himself obeys it. He would not intervene in the affairs of men until he became a man. Once he took upon himself the form of flesh, then he had the authority to take it to the devil. That's good news. Satan didn't get his authority directly from God. He doesn't have a superior angelic power that he uses over the human race. The devil was stripped of all his angelic power and authority. The power and authority that Satan has used to rule this earth has been mankind's authority that God gave them, and they then turned over to Satan. Understanding that Satan could do nothing in your life without your consent and cooperation puts him down in the plane to where you see he isn't a superior foe. As a master deceiver, he's still a threat because he can lie to you. You must know the truth and be on guard, but you can resist him. I know I can win this battle. I can take the power and the authority that God has given me and confront the devil. I'm not ignorant of him, but I'm no longer afraid of him either. I've seen awesome things just because, 
happen just because I recognize that Satan has been defeated. And not one single time in the New Testament is the church ever told to pray to get rid of, to God, to get rid of the devil. He says, you deal with the devil. You deal with it. You take your authority. I have given you tools. And if you give your children things to do, and you go, okay, you have all the tools to finish this project or to do whatever, that's what he's done with us. We've already, we've got everything we need. We don't need to go begging to God to fix the devil when we've already got those, we've got that power and that authority. Grandma's room. Like most <laughs> people who are raised in typical America, I honestly don't think about demons. I've read about them in the Bible, but I thought all the demons were overseas in some third, <laughs> some third world country. I don't think that there were demons here. I didn't think that there were demons here and that we could physically encounter them. Then I got turned on to the Lord and began to look more closely at the Bible. I recognize that the spirit realm is as real today as it was 2,000 years ago. I realized that many different things were demonic, including sicknesses. My friends and I began casting demons out of the people and seeing miraculous things happen. My grandmother raised me until I was about six years old. Then she became senile and eventually died while, when I was eight. When she died, she left some demons behind in the room she occupied in our house. Right after she passed on, I moved out of the room I was sharing with my brother into what had been my grandmother's room. We had a picture of her sitting on the dresser, and at night, it would come alive. Her image would come out of the frame and walk around the room. Since I was only eight years old, that scared the fire out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this was strange, and it wasn't the way it was supposed to be, but I was afraid to tell my mother and my father because they would have thought I was crazy. So I just didn't say anything about it. But as soon as possible, I moved out of that room and back into <laughs> my <laughs> with my brother. He thought, well then, I'll take the other room. <laughs> and he moved in there. It wasn't a month before he moved back in with me. A whole month? He stayed there a whole month? <laughs> no, <laughs> no way. Then my sister took that room. <laughs> it wasn't a month before she moved back out of there too. For the next 12 years, we kept that room in our house locked up. <laughs> Nobody ever said anything. And nobody liked being in there. My older sister brought her newborn daughter home when I was 14 years old. She'd be sound asleep, but if they walked into that room, she would wake up crying. Then they'd walk out, and she'd be okay. Walk in, she'd cry. Walk out, she was okay. When I had Bible studies, people would go all over the house and pray with others, but nobody would go in that room. After a while, my lightning fast mind began to figure out that something was wrong in there. Not long after I became aware that demons were real and that they could exercise influence, I decided to go in that room and cast them out of our house. We always kept that door to the room closed, so when I went in and shut the door behind me, I started rebuking and binding and doing everything that I could think of. All the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I was afraid and had goosebumps all over me. In the midst of this, I remember thinking, Oh, God, I'm so glad I can't see in the spirit realm right now. If I could, I'd see these huge demons towering over me with fangs and claws. I was envisioning these monstrous demonic powers that were inches away from devouring me, and it was only the name of Jesus that was holding them at bay. I remember praying, Oh, God, thank you that I can't see what's going on in the spirit realm. Immediately, immediately the Lord spoke to my heart saying, Andrew, if I were to show you the spirit realm, instead of seeing those huge, powerful demons with fangs and claws, you'd see tiny little imps. You'd be amazed. They're nothing. They just have big mouths. They know how to scream loud and intimidate. They boast of great things, but they can't deliver. As soon as the Lord changed that image from the towering demons to little imps who had no power or authority, faith rose up in my heart. Instead of fear, I felt like an incredible hulk. The spirit of might and boldness came over me, and I got rid of those demons in no time flat. You might think that was all in your mind. Well, I didn't tell a single person, but the next time we had Bible study, people went right into that room without thinking anything about it. There was definitely a difference. There's a lot of people who think Satan's running down here, and I'm not saying that he doesn't deceive a lot of people, and a lot of people are allowing him to work through them, but he 
He doesn't have to be after us. You know, he's that little imp that we send out in the cold or stomp him out, send him away. Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you the power to tread, or the authority, to tread on the serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. For there's nothing, 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 nothing shall by any means hurt you. And that's Luke 10, 19. And I think that's one of the things you just keep, there's nothing that can hurt me. There's nothing that can hurt me, not through this spirit realm. Satan's only power. After the devil made all his prideful boasts in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, saying, I will do this and I will do that. This passage of scripture goes on to say, Yea, though thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth so tremble, the earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms? He made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of the prisoners? Isaiah 14, 15 through 17. This passage prophesied how people would eventually respond to Satan. Of course, all of this came, has come to pass now that Jesus has literally destroyed the devil through his death, burial, and resurrection. When we see Satan, as he really is, we'll say, is this the one who intimidated me? Is this the one I allowed to ruin my life? Is this the one I let keep me in bondage? This nothing, this zero? That's how Satan is. He doesn't have all the power that the church has attributed to him. The only power Satan has come from, came from man. Mankind made Satan. We are the ones who empowered him. God created Lucifer, a ministering spirit, an angelic being. Mankind yielded our God-given dominion, and it's this human authority that, and power that Satan uses. That's why he has to have a body to possess. That's why a pig has more power and authority on this earth than a disembodied demon. Satan is a factor, but only because people yield to him. If you know the truth, the truth will make you free. John 8, 32. Now that's good news. Amen. Amen. You know, I, I like the fact that you, you just start to get in your head that this is not a big deal. You know, whether it's your, your lacking or your health or whatever it is, taking that authority and, and sharing it. We had a, a, I have one of my little girls, because we pray over each other all the time, and she said, so-and-so got hurt today, and I just prayed over her. And I looked at the other little girl, and I go, are you healed? She goes, uh-huh. And I said, you have done your job. This is exactly what Jesus wants you to do. And, you know, she's five. And she's praying over. You know, I think there's as much power in these little ones as there are some of the big ones. A whole lot less baggage. You know, do all, what did you think of this chapter? Do you all have some comments on this one? Thank you. Page 69. Um, when we talk about building a rapport with people when mm -hmm. we're when we're uh, witnessing to them, how many of us pray in tongues, pray in the spirit, because you're a laborer. We're the laborers. We are. We are to go out there, and we. God gives us the opportunity mm -hmm. to come in contact with people. How many of us are doing and taking that? that step. You pray in the spirit, you pray in tongues because you want to be able to share the word of God with people, right? Right. How about people that you know personally, your parents, your sister, your brother, uh, friends, do we pray and when that opportunity comes, do we speak the word of God to them and give them the opportunity to, uh, to accept Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior? Because you know what? It's said and I don't know whose book it was, maybe it was Copeland's, that the best kept secret with the Christians is not to share Jesus Christ with people. Mm -hmm. But how many of us use those opportunities to share with people? And you pray in the spirit, and you ask the Lord to bring people in your path so that you can witness to them not stick a track at them, okay, but to get a relationship going. Mm -hmm. 
and it may be a store that you normally go to. All right? So, okay, I ran into somebody at, at a store. I, I was doing some shopping, never expected this. This woman looks over at me, and she smiles, and I just kept on going. And all of a sudden, she looked again, and she said, you look so good, you look so happy. Well, under my breath, I'm praying in the spirit. Well, before you know it, we started a conversation. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said, just give her the card on the end, you know, with the salvation message in it. And she thanked me for it. Now, there's no pressure. She can go home, she can read that card, and she can accept Jesus. But then she asked me for my phone number. Oh, sure. So now we've got a conversation going on through texting. But how many of us take that opportunity? Or when you see a friend that's gone astray, do we take, are we afraid to say something? Or don't we think, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If you have a friend that's going amok, and you know that what they're doing, they're just going to have more heartache, do you say, I got to talk to you about this, but pray in the spirit and God will give you the words, but he'll prepare that person to hear it. Or we keep on seeing this, this person that we know keep on messing up and messing up. We're supposed to be speaking to them. We're supposed to be praying that they come across our path and then showing them through the word of God, get that conversation going with them. How many of us do that? That's something that I think is more really, really important because that's what we're supposed to be doing, the Great Commission. Amen. True? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when, when you're in the store, you're talking to somebody at the checkout, for instance, and this gal was really, this is in the same day, and she was, and I said, I think you are so nice. She said, you are just a lovely lady. I said, thank you. I said, I want to give you this here. And you read that when you're done today. Thank you. You see, there's no pressure. But how many of us are doing that? People I are hungry for the word. Like with my mother, whenever I had an opportunity, I would share things with her. Mm -hmm. How many of us do that? Our parents, are these people that we know, are they going to hell? Are we afraid to say something? Are we afraid they're going to cut us off? Well, you know what? They just might be waiting for somebody to tell them. Isn't that what? Does anybody else do that? Mm -hmm. Make a relationship with people and then what? Let's have some testimonies so that what we do is we start to do more of this. Because we're out there and we're running into so many people, right? Yeah. Or are we just praying for other laborers to come across their path yes. when we should be doing yes. it? Yes. And I, I think we're, we do need to get out there more. That's, God is pushing us. I feel like God has been stretching me lately and pushing yes. me to do more and more yes. and get out there. I, I deal with a youth group that's our teenagers and, you know, just telling my story. You know, you're like, okay, I got 15 minutes. But, you know, you got to tell a story and try to connect with these children because you want to tell them about Jesus. Yeah. And sometimes they're kind of standoffish because they're 15, 16. But that's, we are put in their paths. We yes. are those people. Yeah. And I, I do. I've given that card out several times. I do. And it may, it, it's helpful to have a little tool mm -hmm. without just saying, here's a track. Here's a track, here's a track, but people are looking for things, and if we're going to be those people, we need to be ready to just go ahead and talk to them and not be afraid. But the thing of it is, are we doing it? See, that's the difference, because are we afraid to do it, or we don't think we're supposed to be doing it, but when we set our minds to do it, then we will. And I like the fact of just asking God, bring those people to me. I don't know that I've asked that, to be honest. I mean, there's been times where in my life I probably have, but, you know, I talk about my little ones coming to me, you know, yes. but adults are harder and sometimes a little scarier. Uh, but 
greater in me than in the world, right? So we, don't, we, have, we have Jesus. We have everything. Like you said, you pray in the Spirit, you know exactly what that person needs. Yeah. You know, also, if somebody is not feeling well, you know, you can say, can I pray for you? Well, I would never do that. No, you wouldn't, but I would. Mm -hmm. And it opens a door. And once you start doing it, it gets so much easier. I mean, I have a very unique situation, so we can stop, drop, and pray all the time. Not only with the little ones, but the big ones, too. You know, you'll talk with a friend who's hurting someone's past, someone's, you know, trouble in their world, and you just stop and pray for them right then. And it's, it's nice when you can just grab their hands. I don't think there's anything worse than, than any more than when I hear someone go, well, I'll pray for you. Now, if they've just prayed with me and say, I'll continue having you in my prayers, I'm okay with that, but okay, I'll pray for you, honey. I don't know. Will you? Or will you forget about me in 30 seconds? Right. Pray with them right Let's then. Pray then. Yeah. You know, to, to pray in the store. Mm -hmm. I can do that. Mm -hmm. I can, you know, going to our class reunion, my class reunion and Pastor Kenny's class reunion, I got to pray with people at both of these class reunions, not only this year, but a couple of years ago. And it, my best friend was healed of cancer, stage four cancer. You know, mm -hmm. and you look at then another one that had staph infection in his leg. A, a, a few weeks later, it's being healed. It's getting smaller. Like Dixie said, that doesn't happen with staph infection. It's because you have prayed for them. Yes. And we have authority. Don't be afraid. Don't shy away from it. Just go into it. It's, it's kind of like I think Anthony uh, Andrews talks about one of his friends says, oh, you know, it's not me. It's not me. Well, we know it's not you. Yeah. We know where the power source is. But was, it, was the donkey that Jesus rode in on, you know, was he going, oh, it's not me. It's not me. I'm, you know, it's like, no, we, we know it's not you. It's we're not cheering for the donkey. We're cheering for the Savior. So I think that's another thing. We have to just remember, he gives us, he makes us, he says we're little gods, the little G. And we're not deity, but we have authority again over, and when he died, he gave us even more than we had what we had lost before. You know, something as simple, and I told you guys this, I'm talking on the phone to the scale, and I'm ordering something for Pastor Kenny. And I said, God bless you. Oh, I take it. And pretty <laughs> soon we're talking. Okay, 20 minutes later, she, she, I prayed over her through the phone, right? She's in California to have the gift of tongues. She has friends, but I don't know how to do it. I said, do you want to get that now? Yes. I said, this is what you're going to do. And the Holy Spirit is going to come on your vocal cords, and you're going to pray in tongues. Do you agree? Yes. I started, bang. Obeying. Can do those things. Is what comes to my mind, is obeying. You know, David took out Goliath because he was obeying. You know, and he walks up on a situation where this big giant is talking bad about his God, our God. And he said, I'm not taking that. I'll go out there. I'll do it. Be David's. Tell you, you know, you get a high. You get such a high when you release the word and they receive it. Even if they didn't receive it, you planted a seed. Now somebody else will water it. Doesn't anybody else have, when they've done that, who wants to tell to give other people ideas? I had to go pick up um, some tinctures for my son, Matt, from a lady. And anyways, um, she started speaking to me about the woke, all the woke people. And she was talking, and I said, okay, but we don't need to talk about that. And she looked at me, and I said, do you realize God has created each one of them? Each one of them have been created by God so that we all have the same spirit in us. She's looking at me, and I said, so now what you pray for is for that spirit to come alive in them. Mm -hmm. It's just dull, and it can't, it's not hearing right now, but it's really in them. So they're not woke. 
The devil wants you to believe that, but they're not. They're all a speaking spirit, just like us. Now start speaking that and bringing that out of them. And she looks at me and she goes, I'm going to do that. I said, that's a good idea. Yes, it is. Uh, the other night, Mike and I were at a campfire with our... So the other night, Mike and I were at a campfire with our friends, and um, Maddie, her parents, were there. And I just got to talk with her mom even. You know, she's in her 40s, and she told me a lot of her life story about how multiple times in her life, like, she put, how she wrote it, like, the cart before the horse. Um, and then she kind of had revelation about it, about it when she was in her mid-20s um, and changed at that point, including choices she made for her kids and everything like that. And then she started talking, I don't even know how we got there, but we started talking about, like, Trump and things like that. And then we started talking about church, and we started talking about just all of that stuff. And it got to a point where we started talking about tongues. She didn't know that tongues could be, like, transferred or a gift that's given. She thought, like, if you had that gift, you were, like, born with it, and that's it. You can't get it if you don't have it. Mm -hmm. So I talked to her about that. I talked to her, like, how we could share that with her. And she wasn't ready at the time. But point being is this is a person I'm going to keep seeing multiple times so that seed was planted, and now it'll keep flourishing. And eventually, if and when she's ready and wants it, I believe that she would come back to either Mike or myself mm -hmm. and ask for that. Even much so of Maddie's husband, even Tyler, which is one of Mike's best friends. Um, you know, Mike tried to get him saved as a kid. Never really worked because his mother didn't also enforce it. Um, but now that he's married to Maddie, Maddie got him saved. So it's one of those of like Mike kind of planted the seed put it on the shelf, right. and then someone else came along. Same thing with Mike's dad. Mike tried to do that seed, put it on the shelf, and now his new girlfriend pushed that through. So it's inter interesting to see some of those things happen. It's exciting to see the harvest. Yeah. You know, that's probably one of my favorite things about small children. You see the harvest very quickly. Why don't we play this video? It's very good, and we're going to jump a little bit ahead, so hopefully we can where we, you'll, you'll catch on pretty quickly. This is Andrew. Uh, form. And once you understand this, it really reduces Satan and his power, and you recognize that without our consent and cooperation, Satan can do nothing. Now that needs a little footnote to it, because even though you may not be cooperating with the devil, there's plenty of other people who are cooperating with the devil, and so the devil can still hurt you because other people submit. But if no one was submitting to the devil, Satan is absolutely powerless and has zero authority apart from us. It is human power and authority that Satan has been using against the human race. Now that is a quick summary of what I've said all last week. And again, if you've missed any of this, you really need to get this teaching, specifically the uh, teaching that is entitled, Who Made Satan? And let me just say that the scripture says in John 4, 24, that God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. Satan, an, uh, or let me rephrase that, Lucifer, an angelic being, was a spirit. They do not have physical bodies, either God or the devil. And this is the reason that God, to be honest and trustworthy and true to his promise that he gave authority over this earth to mankind, could not or would not just come down and wipe the slate clean and start all over and fix this thing. He gave power and authority to physical human beings, and God was a spirit, and so God wasn't physical. And this is why he has allowed Satan to run rampant up until the time that Jesus came. And even after Jesus came and brought back, bought back our authority and power, God shares this power and authority with physical human beings, and he has to flow through us. Now, I said a mouthful right there, more than what probably most people got. And so I'm going to go back and just slow down and make some of these points. If you understand what I've said up to this point, then I tell you what, this has the potential of answering a lot of questions. You know, some people don't even think this way, but I remember that for years, ever since I was a little kid, I always wondered, Lord, why did you wait 
4,000 years from the fall of Adam until the time that Jesus came to redeem the world. Those people during those 4,000 years, they didn't have the same benefits. There wasn't the same salvation. There was an oppression under the devil that these people could not get rid of in a way that New Testament believers don't have to deal with these kind of things. And so I had this question, Lord, why did it take 4,000 years? Another question of mine was, God, why did you have to send Jesus? When I got a revelation of the suffering that he went through, and how much he hated becoming sin, and I saw how this grieved God. And I began to get a revelation of that. One of the questions was, is why did you do it this way? Couldn't, you know, you're God. Couldn't you have done anything? And the answer to both of these really comes back to this teaching on authority. I've used this verse before, but in Psalms chapter 89, verse 34, it says, My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone forth out of my lips. When God gave authority over this earth to physical human beings, then God basically took himself out of the loop. He said, you, physical human beings, you have authority, you rule, you subdue, you are in control. Now, God as owner could have come down here and have destroyed the earth. I believe he could have started over. But if he wanted to keep this earth and keep the men that he had created alive, then he had to honor the word that he had given it. It was a covenant. It had gone out of his lips, and he wouldn't break it. And since he was a spirit, he no longer could just come down and interfere and uh, change the way that man was running the earth. He gave that authority to him. And so, now this answers both of those questions I was talking about. The reason it took 4,000 years for Jesus to come into manifestation and for God to redeem us and to buy us back and put us back in charge is because when he created the first Adam, he was in absolute control. He hadn't delegated authority yet to anybody else. And so he was able to just say, let us make man in our image. Notice that in Genesis chapter 1, I believe it's verse 26, 27, 28, those three verses right there, it says that God spoke man into existence. That's the way he created the worlds. That's the way he said, let there be light. He said, let the earth bring forth uh, all of these trees and animals and all of this. He spoke everything into existence. And when he had absolute authority and power, he hadn't delegated it yet to his creation, he just spoke Adam and Eve into existence and they came into being. But after he had created them, he turned the control the authority to rule and to dominate this earth over to physical human beings. And now that mankind had yielded themselves to the devil, how was he going to create the second Adam, as it mentions over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? One that didn't have sin flowing through his blood. It had to be a virgin birth. He needed the physical body, but he needed to be sinless. And so there needed to be another creation, similar to the way that Adam was created. But God no longer was in absolute control, so he couldn't just speak him into existence. What he had to do was flow through people and get people to speak the things that needed to be said so that Jesus could come into this earth. Now, this is major. This is really, really important. I know that you're having to think, and sometimes people want to just watch something and be entertained, but you need to think about this. God gave control over this earth to physical human beings. Therefore, he could not just, boom, create Jesus. What he had to do was speak to the spirit of people, and as they would believe and respond to him, then they would prophetically utter these words and speak forth things. And I could go through and show you literally dozens, probably hundreds of scriptures that were necessary to be spoken by people for Jesus' physical body to be created. Uh, there's a lot of them. Like, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 7, or some of the most amazing, where Isaiah prophesied and said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And it goes on and it prophesies all of these things. It had to be prophesied that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. It had to be prophesied all of the things that Isaiah said in chapter 52 and 53 
about that he was wounded for our transgressions. And all of these things needed to be prophesied. God spoke Adam into existence. He was no longer absolutely in control over the earth. He had given that control to man. And so now he had to speak to the spirits of man and get man to speak forth these, these words that were necessary to create the second Adam. And the problem is, just like Isaiah, I am amazed that Isaiah was strong enough in his faith to stand up before a king and boldly proclaim that a virgin is going to conceive. Did you know that that's just radical to the max? Man, I'm glad that God isn't having me go on nationwide television and say that a virgin is going to have a child because, you know what, people would just ridicule that. And yet, <clears throat> when Isaiah said it, it had never been conceived before. Nobody had ever talked about a virgin having a child. This was a radical statement, and, and Isaiah <clears throat> had to have a lot of faith to be able to speak forth that word. And God had to speak through Jeremiah. There were prophecies about from Jeremiah, and all of the prophets and, and all of these things had to be spoken about Jesus. And the reason I believe that it took 4,000 years from the fall of Adam until the time of Jesus is because no one person was in communion with God enough to get everything that needed to be said. They didn't have enough faith to speak it all forth. They, you know, the scripture says, Paul said, that we only know in part and we prophesy in part. God had to take literally dozens or hundreds of people over 4,000 years period of time, and each one of them would get a little piece, a little part of the puzzle, and they would speak forth what God was speaking to them. And the reason it took 4,000 years for Jesus to come on the scene is because it took 4,000 years for God to find enough people who would yield to him, who would speak, and who would deliver the words that needed to be said, God-inspired words to create this physical body of the Lord Jesus. Well, that is a powerful truth. And here's another thing, and you know, I've got teaching on this that goes into hours worth. I'm saying these things very quickly. But this is how the virgin birth of Jesus came to pass too. Let me turn over and just read some of these verses in Luke chapter 1. It talks about how that the angel came and appeared unto Mary and prophesied to her and said she would have a child. And she says, how's this going to be, seeing I know not a man? And uh, the angel answered and said, the Holy Ghost, this is in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Some translations say that no word of God is without power of fulfillment. And anyway, Mary says, how's this going to be? And he says, the power of the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and, the, and you are going to supernaturally conceive. And then he says, no word from God is without power of fulfillment or with God, nothing is impossible. And look at Mary's response. She said, behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now, this is a major point, too. I pray that you're really listening to this. You know what really happened at the virgin birth? The virgin birth was totally normal, natural. There was nothing supernatural about it except the way that the conception took place. Instead of a man planting a seed, God's Word was the seed. And this is exactly what 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says, that being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God that lives and abides forever. It says that the Word of God is an incorruptible seed. And so what this angel did, all of these men throughout history, over 4,000 years period of history, had been inspired by God, had spoken in the power of the Holy Ghost, and had released their little portion of what God gave them to say. Then Gabriel came to Mary and said, you're going to conceive. She says, how's this going to be? And he says, it's going to be through the power of the Holy Spirit. Mary received the word and said, so be it unto me according to thy word. And the Holy Spirit 
to all of these God-inspired words that were spoken by dozens or hundreds of people over 4,000 periods of years, took those words and literally put the Word of God in Mary's womb, impregnated her, and the Word became the seed. And this is exactly why the Scripture says over in John chapter 1 that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's really very appropriate to call Jesus the Word because God spoke Him into existence through dozens or possibly a hundred different people over a 4,000 year period of time. The Holy Spirit took these words and impregnated Mary. Now that was the supernatural, super, uh, you know, uh, human part of it. And then from that time on, after the conception took place, the rest of the virgin birth was completely normal and natural. It was the fact that the Word became the seed. Now that is a powerful truth. Now this answers those two questions. Why did it take 4,000 years? Because God didn't have one person who was so yielded to him that he could just receive everything and speak as God. People got little bits and pieces over 4,000 years period of time and it took that long for God to find the right people to say the things necessary that it could, that, that, you know, when he created Adam, he just spoke and said, let us, and boom, it happened. But now that he was no longer directly in control, but he was having to flow through people, took 4,000 years, dozens, maybe 100 people, for him to speak all of these things through. And then the Holy Spirit took that and impregnated Mary. And this also answers, why did Jesus have to become a man? Why couldn't God have done it some other way? It's because God is a spirit. And only men, physical human beings, had a power and authority on this earth. Look at this verse over in John chapter 5. Jesus is giving a defense of himself. And people were saying, what authority do you have to do this? And Jesus said in John chapter 5 and in verse 26, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. This term, Son of Man, always refers to the humanity, the physical side of Jesus. The term, Son of God, refers to the divinity side of Jesus. So he's saying here, the reason I have authority to execute judgment is because of this physical body. So this answers that question. Why did Jesus have to become a man? Couldn't God have done things other way? No, because God is a spirit. God had to become a man to come down here into this domain and have power and authority. There was no man because that could redeem themselves or the human race because every man had been corrupted themselves. They were born in sin. So God had to conceive a sinless man. He had to become a man and come down here so that he could deal on this plane and now have authority. And now the devil was in big trouble because here's God who, you know, I used this example last week that in a sense, Satan used mankind like a hostage and said, God, if you get me, you know, you're going to have to destroy them also. They willingly submitted unto me. But now God himself became one of the hostages and now God had the authority to deal with Satan. And I mean, Jesus destroyed, defeated Satan on every level. Satan made the huge mistake of crucifying Jesus and took him to hell. And when Jesus went down into the lower parts of the earth, I mean, he came out of hell. He destroyed Satan, not only here in this physical earth, but he went down into the lowest parts of the earth he defeated Satan and he came out with the keys of death and of hell dangling on his side. And then he told his disciples, he says, all authority in heaven and in earth is given unto me. See, God originally had all authority, but then he delegated that authority to mankind. Mankind screwed it all up by yielding to the devil. And when they did, in a sense, God was shielded from coming and fixing things because he was a spirit and didn't have this physical body. But when he became a physical human being, then Jesus said, now I have authority to execute judgment upon the devil because of this physical body. 
And now Satan had lost his shield. He had lost his hostage. His hostage had turned out to. Amen. And now we have that same authority in his name. I just like the way he, he just said some of the things about Jesus that made me think a little deeper. And I'm going to pass our plate so we can give because I want to be part of this kingdom. I want to be a part of it. I want to sow into it both financially and physically. I think, Pastor, what you said was amazing because that's what we need to do is get out there and talk to people. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you. Father, we just thank you for the privilege that we can come and bring our tithes and offerings to you, Father. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And then, thank you. 1 John 1.17, it says, But if we walk in the light as, as in the light... We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So when he died, Jesus shed his life and his blood for us. His body was broken, and, you know, that first, that last supper, he just looked up and said, take, this is my body, it's broken for you, take and eat this, in Jesus' name. For him to shed his blood, that gives us a, a covenant that stands so strong, way beyond what the Old Testament had, that we have a new, stronger covenant. And it's, this is like a seal between God and people. It's his blood right here. So take, drink, and remember what he did. That blood is very, very powerful. Well, we thank you guys so much. Next week is Chapter 9. Um, kind of be thinking, too, uh, as we think about Chapter 9, um, a lot more or less in the book of Acts on how much, how much um, power we have through Christ, obviously. But just come more prepared about thinking about how much power we really have, what the disciples had back then, and know that we still have that power, but let's just kind of talk about the power that we actually have. And, you know, so we can discuss that more next week. Did you all have any other comments? One more. You know, Brenda, you read the book now, The Blood Covenant. What did you think real quick? Um, just that it was, it requires the cooperation it's that cooperation between man and God, and that's why God's not in control. That's why he, his sovereignty is limited voluntarily, so that that cooperation flows between us and him. So when you think we have a covenant with the Almighty God, that's why we never lose a battle. We never lose a battle, and there is nothing we can't do. Nothing. Amen. See you guys next week.